Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael here with another episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. And today my guest is Nicolette Hahn Nyman, who is a rancher, former environmental lawyer, and author of three books about sustainable and regenerative meat. She has written for the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and Wall Street Journal, and is, was a regular blogger for The Atlantic. She lives in Northern California with her husband, Bill Nyman, founder of the meat companies Nyman Ranch and NB Ranch and their two sons. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm happy to be with you. Yeah, it's such a privilege to have you. Um, I, the Atlantic is something I definitely read on a regular basis. They have some interesting reporting and uh, especially on some of these bigger topics. And so it's great to have some place that I can go to there to, to read their long form articles. Yeah, and they've done quite a bit of um, coverage on the food issue and mm-hmm. agriculture too, actually, um, for, for many years, even when a lot of other publications were kind of ignoring it. So it was fun writing for them. Yes, and you have a list of, because you have a new book out, and that's why we have you on today to talk about that, obviously, and then the bigger um, you know, aspect of beef and why eating beef is all good for you and saving the environment and all. But you have a bevy, I guess I would say, of people who are endorsing your book. Everyone from Gabe Brown to, of course, Rebecca, um, Joel Salatin, Temple Grandin. Wow. Alice Waters. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, I'm kind of fortunate because, you know, I worked as an environmental lawyer, so I know people in the environmental community. Yes. And my husband, of course, has been, you know, Bill Nyman has been very deeply involved Mm -hmm. in the food scene in, you know, North America for for decades. So he has um, long standing relationships with a lot of chefs. And then, you know, in the, for the last 18 years, I've been directly involved in agriculture myself. And I've gotten to know a lot of the people that are trying to remake, you know, the way farming is done. So I get, you know, it's, it's, I have a wonderful network of people that I work with, and I'm really appreciative and grateful for the support they've been showing me for this book. Mm -hmm. But for so many years, you were, I'm not going to say on the other side of the issue, but you were vegetarian. So talk to us about that transition from, you know, being a vegetarian for 33 years. Yeah. Well, interestingly, I was never, I would, like you said, I wasn't really on the other side of the issue because I grew up, you know, I I grew up one of these kids that spent a lot of time out in nature and my parents used to, I grew up in Southwestern Michigan and my parents used to take us, um, very frequently out to farms in the southwestern Michigan area to um, pick our own fruit because mm-hmm. we had four kids in our family and they wanted to have a lot of fruit in the house and it was expensive. <laughs> so it was a great way to, you know, feed the yep. family. And we also used to, um, we had several friends in the area that had small farms and we used to sometimes even go out and help them with whatever harvest they were doing and that sort of thing. So I had this like really from very early on, I had this connection to, I grew up in, you know, kind of a suburban neighborhood, but I had this connection to the farms in Southwestern Michigan. And I always had this idea that I would retire to a farm one day. And, um, then it, you know, happened sooner than I planned, but, uh, but I didn't ever have the kind of you know, animal rights activist perspective of that's it's wrong to raise animals for food. That just never made sense to me. And mm. especially because I then majored in biology in college. And I've just always seen, um, you know, animals and plants and, you know, fungi as all being sort of connected and really humans as part of that interconnected world. And so the idea that you would sort of try to pluck the human out of that, you know, Mm. in that complex interrelationship um, and say, well, we shouldn't be doing, you know, what all the other creatures are doing, which is sort of consuming each other and being connected with him. That that never made any sense to me from an ethical standpoint. So I I was a vegetarian for 33 years, started freshman year in college and just stopped um, a year and a half ago. Um, but it was never uh, really from the basis of the feeling that it was wrong to eat animals. I, I never believed that. But what I did believe, you know, um, growing up, um, I was already kind of an environmental activist, young environmental activist. And then in college, I was 
um, not just majoring in biology, but I was um, involved in environmental organizations on campus. And I started to think, well, if you're, you know, really concerned about the environment, you shouldn't be eating meat because mm -hmm. there was a lot, there is a lot of that discussion nowadays. And there was a lot of discussion about that at that time as well. And um, primarily from an environmental perspective that it was just too resource intensive, that it was um, triggering deforestation in the Amazon, all those ideas. And then also there was a lot of attention being paid to the idea that saturated fat is dangerous and that there's yes. a lot of saturated fat in meat, especially beef and other red meat. So those were the main drivers for me becoming a vegetarian. And then um, interestingly, when I married my husband 18 years ago, he was a cattle rancher. He was a meat industry founder and, you know, well-known figure in yeah. the, you know, and a CEO of the Nyman Ranch Company at that time, in fact. And it, what's really interesting about my husband, he's, he's a very self-confident man, and he never um, felt that he needed to convert me to meat eating. You know, he, he thought, you know, uh -huh. well, I don't, you know, have that diet myself, but I understand her perspective and that's okay with me. And especially because he knew I was really supportive of, you know, raising yeah. animals well. But I, um, my transition back to being omnivorous probably started when I had our two children. Um, during the pregnancies, um, I was a healthy person, thankfully, but mm -hmm. there were challenges both times as far as, especially my iron levels yes. in my blood. Yep. You know, it was being monitored and, um, you know, I was, you know, getting regular good prenatal care and they were checking my blood for things. And one of the things they were saying is your, your, you know, your iron is really low. Yeah, and I began, anemic. you know, doing a lot to try to supplement that both in terms of, you know, just taking a supplement, but also making sure I was eating a lot of iron rich foods. And I was able to get my level up to where it was considered safe. Um, but it was a struggle. And, um, I already at that time started to suspect that I probably should be eating red meat, you know, in order for my health and for the children that I was, you know, that were inside my body to be healthy. And then when they were born, each of my two boys were born, I wanted them to have, you know, the healthiest diet possible. So I was never even considering not feeding them meat because I think it's very nutrient rich food. Yeah. And so I began cooking quite a bit of uh, meat and fish and things like that, that I previously hadn't cooked before. I mean, I cooked it in my lifetime when I was a lot younger, but in, you know, the recent decades, I hadn't done it. And my husband used to prepare his own meat. And then he would also, you know, get it when we were eating out or whatever. But then I, you know, I started regularly cooking meat and it got me more interested in, you know, just thinking about meat as food and, you know, mm -hmm. delicious, healthy food. And then when I turned the real sort of turning point for me was when I turned 50 and I decided, uh, I want to have kind of the healthiest possible, you know, next few decades. And um, I've seen people all around me as they age, you know, really 50 is a really critical moment, you know, for people, mm -hmm. especially for women, where your body starts functioning differently and your, you know, your muscle mass really starts declining, your bone density really starts declining quite dramatically. And that's kind of, unless you do, you know, everything you possibly can to stop that from happening. And the two most important things you can do are to exercise and to eat really nutrient rich foods mm. and meat, especially is incredibly valuable for keeping your muscle mass and, or even gaining muscle mass. And, um, and then um, bone density is very closely tied to your muscle mass. So I decided, you know, I'm going to um, add meat back into my diet because I want to be healthy as I age. I don't want to, you know, begin, I don't want to get dependent on a lot of medications and supplements and things like that. And um, that was, like I said, about a year and a half ago, and I've really enjoyed eating meat and I haven't had any troubles with, um, you know, reincorporating it back into my yeah. diet. And I haven't had any regret at all. <laughs> yeah. No remorse. That's awesome. So uh, growing up for a couple of years, our family did go vegetarian and uh, that was because we couldn't get good meat. Uh -huh. And, um, I really actually think, you know, there were seven of us kids. So there's obviously very easy to see like the different as like when that vegetarianism hit us as kids. And it's interesting okay. to see some of the kids and, and yeah. just the, it, the health issues they've had since then. And again, you can't blame it completely on that, but that was, gosh, that was 20 years ago now. And the, what was available for vegetarianism was not anywhere near what it is today. So it was a little bit harder to have a well-balanced uh, with the right nutrients. Yeah. And in fact, um, as a child, um, I just had one, um, you know, family that I was close friends with that had that were eating vegetarian diets and the adults in the family 
um, became vegetarians as adults, but they had two daughters and they were, um, uh, you know, the, the daughters were raised entirely vegetarian and they were both extremely petite, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I think about that now, I've been thinking about that a lot in the last few years. I suspect that they were probably smaller than they would have been, you know, if they were yeah. eating meat in their diet. And, you know, I mean, you can have debates about whether, you know, humans need to be the largest possible size or whatever. Yeah. But I personally, you know, like in feeding my own kids, it's incredibly important to me that I give them foods that support their genetic potential. You know, I want them mm -hmm. to be, you know, I want them to have healthy jaws and teeth and bones and muscles. And I don't want, you know, anything that I'm doing now to either prevent them from growing or thriving in any way or having any kind of developmental problems or long-term health issues. So I, I just really feel that the omnivorous diet with real foods, you know, that's mm -hmm. kind of the cornerstone to me, um, is the best possible way to, you know, especially with children and, and older people. I mean, I think those are kind of the two populations yeah. that most definitely need the best possible nutrition. When you're kind of between ages 20 and 40, you can kind of probably eat whatever you want <laughs> yes. and be reasonably healthy. You're just kind of coasting, yeah. but it's in those developmental years. And it's in those years when your body is beginning to struggle a little bit uh, as yeah. far as, you know, um, maintaining all of its systems. And so that's when the food becomes exceptionally important for maintaining good health. Or if you're having credible nutrient demands, let's say you're a farmer or you're a bodybuilder or an advanced athlete. Um, I've got a friend, Erin, who is a uh, com com competition bodybuilder and just her uh -huh. regiment of uh, how she measures her food to the gram. And she's eaten incredibly clean and incredibly healthy. It blows my mind. I did not have anywhere near that devotion. Yeah. <laughs> See that it's just it really kind of brings it back to you know to perform at those levels what you need to put in your body. Yeah, and also I should have mentioned as well pregnant and um, nursing oh, yeah. mothers. Those are that's the other yeah. category of people that really have what you might almost think of as kind of extreme nutritional demands. You know where it's yeah you know beyond this sort of just maintenance ration that you know we can probably all be okay with. <laughs> you know yeah. assuming we don't have any real health problems or exceptional demands on our bodies except for when we're young and when we're old or so, mm -hmm. you know, I just think, but, you know, I just think long-term thinking about health, you know, for me more and more, especially I, I'm lucky that my parents really thought this way. So I, I kind of, you know, taught that was taught this from a early, early age, but um, it's really about, I mean, there's so much that we can control and the diet is a huge piece of that. You know, lifestyle choices, obviously not smoking, for example, is a critical yeah. choice that really helps your health and, you know, trying to get enough sleep and all these other things, but really diet and exercise. Those are probably the two single most important things you can do. And for me more and more, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that having that real food, not a processed food, you know, not a sugary beverage, not a, you know, complex, you know, like that's why, I, that's why I'm really concerned about, you know, these faux burgers, these alt alternate meat things, uh -huh. because, because those are, um, in, highly processed foods, you know, and when you look at the agricultural side of it, they're almost never from kind of truly sustainable regenerative farming practices. Yes. And then when you look at the, all of the process that goes into it, whether it's, there's often a lot of genetic modification, there's also often um, really dramatic changes that are made to the foods um, and even new substances have been created for a lot of these um, faux burgers. And so, uh, you know, what, what concerns me, uh, I, I don't, not, I, not just, for, I, I actually just don't think they're that healthy healthy for the most part a lot of them are made up of um you know um they have a lot of salt for example and things yes. like that but they're also um lacking in that sort of vitality that i believe real food has biological uh vitality which um dr fred provenza writes about so well in his book nourishment where he talks about the phytochemicals and the secondary compounds in foods and that that is probably almost maybe the most important part of food that we're not even measuring right now and mm. that's basically devoid in you know in processed foods you're eating essentially biologically dead food whereas yes, yeah. if you're eating a piece of meat or you're eating vegetable, fruit, you know, or, you know, essentially minimally or unprocessed foods, you're going to get food that has a lot of components in it that we're not even measuring or aware of. And that's what I think the big difference is between the modern diet 
and you know the sort of traditional diet even the diet that people were eating about 100 years ago you know not mm -hmm. that long ago people were not really eating processed foods and so i think i mean my own feeling is that there's really there's a growing body of evidence showing that both health you know physical health and mental health issues are really connected to that shift in our diets mm -hmm. So I, you know, I'm focused for myself and for my family and in my work more and more on this idea of let's eat real food. Let's eat foods that's, you know, minimally, I mean, when you eat something like pasta, obviously that's a processed food and I think it's okay to eat pasta, but I also think it's something you shouldn't eat every day. You know, you should, yes. um, and same, I would say the same thing about tortilla chips or whatever the food is. It doesn't mean you never eat another tortilla chip again, but it's like, this shouldn't be something you eat very often. It should be yeah. kind of a you know, a little treat. And then, you know, you can eat, in my view, you can eat potatoes as often as you want, as long as they're not potato chips. <laughs> you know? Yes. Like, yes. I think potatoes are, potatoes are so, wonderful. <laughs> yes. So I had, I had tortilla chips for lunch, speaking of potato chips, but <laughs> I did have it paired with literally farm fresh salsa that literally every ingredient except the salt and the limes came from the farm. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and you know, so none of us are ever going to be perfect, right? We're just trying yes. <laughs> to think about these things and to um, get, I just think of it more as like a shift that we do one little step uh -huh. at a time. We we move as much as possible towards foods that are, um, you know, like if possible, raised in our own gardens or on our own farms or from a farm down the road, you know, something in our community. And then if not, if that's not possible, you know, you kind of go the next step, you kind of go to a wider and wider circle in terms of where you get your ingredients from, but just always trying to get as much as possible from nearby and that was recently harvested and that is minimally processed. Yeah. Okay. So look back to the faux burgers, because I know that's a huge thing that's getting billions of dollars of funding from massive people, massive yeah. names out there. Yeah. Um, how many ingredients does the average one have? <laughs> I don't know the, you know, the, the answer to that, but I've looked at a lot of the ingredients labels and, you know, I've, there, it seems like it's about 12 to 15 ingredients, yep. something mm -hmm. in that range. Yeah. And like you said, there are a lot of those are coming with a basis of soy, which right. we, we know is being raised incredibly unregeneratively. Um, and if they're worried about killing of, you know, animals, the amount of mice and, uh, uh, uh of like, uh, reptiles that are killed to produce soy is astronomical. Well, and that's this whole thing is like, you're looking right at, you know, an animal and then you're killing it and you're eating it and you're saying, oh, I don't want to eat animals. Okay. So I, I don't want to eat the burger, but then you're looking at the soy burger and it doesn't look like you killed anything to eat that. And what it really is, is the difference is that that killing happened out of your sight. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're, you're causing, you know, the vast majority of soy is raised the world over is produced, as you know, Michael, you know, in these yeah. massive monocrop fields um, that, you know, re are being plowed and there's, you know, there's all kinds of farm equipment and machinery that are causing all kinds of um, animal death. And it's um, causing um, even more unseen um, destruction to um, wildlife and other animals just by replacing habitat, you know? And so yep. the idea that you're not killing anything, that, that alone is really, um, of, you know, just completely false. Yeah. But also there's that ecological question about your food. And I, more and more, I believe that animals are essential to truly ecologically vibrant food production. You really need them and preferably in diversified ways, you know, having um, lots of different, um, like, like Gabe Brown, as you mentioned, yeah. Gabe Brown, I, he's someone who I really admire and like on a personal level as well. And he's just shown in, in his own farm and in his own book, book, Dirt to Soil, he's shown how having that mixture of mm -hmm. plants and animals and lots of different kinds of plants and animals is the core of what he's doing. And it's the key to creating really uh, vibrant ecosystems in these farming systems. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of the opposite of how all these large scale monocrops like soy are being produced around the world, which are really uh, based on this idea of inputs and outputs and, you know, sort of very linear model of, you know, you put in these uh, agricultural chemicals and you put in the seed and then you ag you know, a lot of times you might be irrigating and then you're um, producing one product. And that's mm -hmm. almost, um, that's a very different approach, which I think is, um, in my view, that that approach has proven um, to, to, to be a failure. 
you know, it's not producing healthy food and it's incredibly environmentally destructive. So I think we need to move away from that. And when you try to think of, well, how do you do things better? Animals immediately become an essential mm -hmm. component. Yeah. So let's talk about that shift because we've got, you know, massive erosion. We've got massive greenhouse gases. Um, I forget the movie that came out, documentary that came out, was it two years ago um, that Ray Archuleta did a lot of, 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 of talking in and he showed the uh, the carbon release basically on the U S and you could see it spike as the fields were planted in the spring, um, which was incredibly, I think that was the most incredibly incredible two minutes of that movie showing that. Yeah. Um, so how do we move these farmers then to uh, regenerative? Because again, they're always coming down to the bottom line. And unfortunately as a nation, we still think it's okay to subsidize corn and soy. Yeah. Well, I do think, all of these huge problems that we're having as a society are, are things that will never be solved with one approach, right? We need mm -hmm. a lot of different approaches working together. And I think on the, you know, you just mentioned the, the subsidies. I think on the subsidy side, agricultural subsidies, and I've, I've talked about this in my writings a lot over the years, agricultural subsidies, I think are fine. I think they're actually probably helpful and important and necessary. But the question is, what are we subsidizing? Mm -hmm. You know, and th the agricultural subsidies as they exist, you know, in North America today is really mostly about output. And it's about, you know, just um, sort of incentivizing farmers to produce sort of this monocrop we were just talking about that we know is so ecologically destructive. And I think what we should be subsidizing is um, things that will benefit the land, the soils, the water and the air over the long term. And when you do that, you know, when you try to create more diverse systems, when you try to create systems that really focus on soil biology, you know, I think that's the kind of thing we need to be subsidizing. Yeah. You're actually going to have uh, sort of the long-term effects of helping helping those um, farms to retain, you know, their ability to generate food over the long term, but you're also, it's going to have a very immediate effect of creating healthier food, because there's now a tremendous amount of research showing that where you have biologically, biologically healthy soils, you actually produce, you know, whatever you're growing, or whatever animals you're raising, are going to have um, more nutrition in them. Mm -hmm. And we know that essentially, you know, there's this huge percentage of Americans now that have diet related diseases. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because they're eating food that is very low in nutrition and high in calories. And so um, the idea of just making food by focusing on soil health, you're making food that is more nutritious um, you will immediately help public health. And over the long term, you'll be able to um, protect the soils that we need, you know, we definitely need to be able to continue to feed ourselves, you know, in the generations to come. So I think, mm -hmm. I think there's a kind of urgent need and it's absolutely possible to shift the way we're subsidizing farming. And I think that's something that, you know, every you know, few years we, you know, take up the, um, the farm bill again and we have all these debates and discussions and there, are, there were some really good discussions and debates the last time the farm bill was approved and, but unfortunately not that much changed. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think there's more and more um, movement toward that nowadays. You know, you have people like Congressman Tim Ryan from Ohio, who's spent a lot of the presidential primary season talking about the importance of um, agriculture that's truly regenerative and then that leading to better human health. And he mm -hmm. was even um, couching it in terms of the cost of, you know, um, health care on the other end of it, oh, which I yeah. thought was brilliant. You know, he was like one of the few people that was kind of connecting all of these dots. And I really appreciated that. So I think um, public subsidies is definitely part of it. But I also think um, people like Gabe Brown, again, um, to mention him again, um, he's just such a powerful uh, um, model, you know, an example yeah. of what can be done because he had this very uh, simple commodity monocrop, you know, I mean, it was, I think he had two crops to be raised there, but large scale, uh, very simple system on the land that he began farming on. And he transitioned that kind of, you know, year over year to a much more complex system that was much more diverse in terms of what it was growing and then integrated animals. And, and what he always says is the more diverse his system became, the more generative it became. Mm -hmm. So I think he, you know, he really shows 
um, how it can be done. And also one of the things he said to me that I thought was super interesting. He said, wherever he speaks around the world, he's spoken in China and Europe and all over the place. And he said, people always say to me, well, I love what you've done there in North Dakota, but what, you know, I don't think I could do this on my land. You know, my place is different. <laughs> and he says, um, oh, that's my, that's our goose in the background. <laughs> our, our pet goose here, uh, making himself heard there. But um, he says people come up to him, Gabe Brown says, um, uh, people come up to him and say, I don't think I can do this on my land. And he says, he tells every single person, you absolutely can do this on your land. You know, not exactly what he's done necessarily, but something that works for your place. Um, just working kind of one, you know, year to year um, with trying new things, making things more diversified, more complex, and thinking in terms of um, focusing on the biological health of your whole system and especially starting from the soil up. So it's just a different mindset. In fact, to quote Gabe again, he said he said something super interesting that I loved. He said, I used to, when I was, you know, just raising corn and soy, I used to lie in bed and think, okay, what do I need to go out there and kill today? You know, yeah. what weed, what insect? And then he he said, now he lies in bed and thinks about all the life that's on his farm. And, mm -hmm. you know, everything from you know, insect life who, um, you know, the USDA uh, entomologist and soil scientist, John, Jonathan Lundgren, um, I gave, a, gave a, a, an amazing talk uh, that I saw a couple years ago at Eco Farm Conference. And he said, essentially, the vast majority of the insects that are going to be on your farm are beneficial. Mm -hmm. And whenever you have too many of one thing, it means your system is out of balance. And the solution is not to just try to wipe out that one insect that never caught, that never solves your problem. And so yeah. he's going around making the argument that we need to not just have more complex systems, but specifically that we got we have to completely change our mindset about the insects and the other living living creatures on our farms. And I I just love these folks that are out there um, just really you know kind of challenging mm -hmm. um, these mainstream assumptions that we've all had for so long. And I think they're showing us the way forward. So, you know, I, I have a lot of hope that farming um, is going to be making this shift. I just hope that it happens soon enough, you know, to where, yeah. um, you know, we need to have these major problems, planetary health and human health addressed as quickly as possible. Yeah. I mean, I think this year alone, we're looking at, I mean, the California is already on fire again. Um, I think that's south of you, right? Or you guys oh. in your area? Um, well, it is. It's all around us, but yes, oh, wow. primarily south of us. But yeah. um, last year we had to pack up our own car with our belongings and we oh, didn't wow. have to evacuate, but we had to be ready because there was a fire just a few miles yeah. away from us. And that's a terrifying thing as yeah. you know. And then we look at Europe, um, massive flooding. Um, yeah. So it's all causing these massive swings because of, I, and one of the things I think is we're losing the carbon in the soil and the carbon is the buffer. And yeah, exactly. The, the whole, you know, the whole health of the system is really um, beginning to collapse. And, uh -huh. and that's kind of terrifying in a way, but it also should be really a call to action for all of us. Um, and I think um, the exciting thing for agriculture is that there's an opportunity to really be part of a whole new way of thinking. And, you know, agriculture occupies such a huge portion of the land surface of the mm -hmm. globe, that when people within agriculture make changes, that has a tremendous impact. So I kind of think of it as, you know, rather than just, you know, being in a state of denial, as some people are, <laughs> unfortunately, yes. or being in a state of, you know, kind of dismissive or, well, there's nothing we can do, you know, or, you know, or helplessness. I think the, the exciting thing that I'm seeing is more and more people taking this as a call to action and saying, okay, we can be part of the solution. And, 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 and that's not necessarily true for people in every profession, right? But it is yeah. definitely true in agriculture. There are, there are um, fairly easy changes that people can make to just really begin start focusing on the health of the soil. You know, and I'm, I'm especially focused on this question of the role of animals and reintroducing animals to create healthy soils and healthy ecosystems where we produce food. But, you know, everything that we do um, in agriculture affects soil health and soil mm -hmm. erosion. And I think we just need to be really proactive, all of us, um, in doing everything we can to make sure that we're focusing on that bottom line question. How is this affecting the biology of the soils here, you know, mm -hmm. wherever we are? And if we start kind of with that as our mind frame, I think we can all improve what we're doing and just keep being more and more part of the solution of bringing the, you know, the, the, the planet back into balance. 
Absolutely. All right. So uh, I, I know there's always these hot button issues people talk about, about beef, you know, people say, all right, yeah. they're, you know, they're belching out methane. So talk to us through a little yeah. bit about that and, and what, where, where you saw the research go on that. Yeah, well, that's an interesting point. Um, the methane thing is something that, you know, I hear talked about a great deal and written mm -hmm. about a great deal. So in the Defending Beef book that is just coming out, um, I, I spend a lot of time talking about methane. In fact, my editor even suggested I cut cut it down a little bit. <laughs> He's <laughs> like, I don't know if you need to say quite this much about methane or get this detail. I yeah. said, no, I actually do. It ended up saying exactly as I had written it because I, I, I explained to him, I said, no, this is a, an issue I've heard people talking about everywhere I go, you know, as I lecture and as I write things, I just hear this all the time, people wanting to understand this issue better. Well, so the sort of bottom line on it is that the methane issue is really a red herring. I've been told again and again that, you know, oh, I don't eat beef or I cut my beef way back because of methane. Well, that just doesn't make any sense because you know, first of all, I mean, to just begin at sort of the beginning of the issue, how me me methane is measured when we talk about it from a public um, policy standpoint, um, there's a professor, a physicist at Oxford University in England who's done some amazing um, research and in now writing and speaking about this. And he was actually on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Scientific Advisory Committee for several years. And so he was one of the people who was actually, you know, doing the work internationally as far as, um, you know, working on what we should do with methane. And he says, he's now um, kind of making the case on the world stage that the whole way that methane is being measured is completely wrong. And essentially there was, um, you know, an agreement, you know, a couple of decades ago that um, we're going to just equate everything. There's a carbon equivalent, you know, we're going to have CO2 and we're going to have uh, methane and there's, of course, carbon carbon in methane, it's CH4 is the, mm -hmm. um, the you know, the, the way it's um, written as a symbol. Um, and we're going to uh, say this much CO2 equals this much methane. And that's how we're going to treat everything that we do in public policy when we say, you know, how we're going to regulate it. And what he's been arguing is that this is scientifically invalid. And it's, you know, in the real world, methane and CO2 function so differently that you actually can't use that system because it has tremendous um, very unfair and inappropriate public policy implications. And the main reason for that, he explains, is that um, CO2 is a gas that when it's emitted, essentially it lasts forever because it lasts you know, hundreds of thousands of years. Methane, on the other hand, is a very short-lived gas. It lives for only about 10 years in the atmosphere. It breaks down after that. And there's a whole sort of cycling of methane that happens in the natural world, in the real world. And so they have a totally different way of functioning, these two gases in the real world. And because of that, he says, the way we're regulating it is really, really inappropriate. So mm -hmm. I start right off in Defending Beef explaining that. And the reason that matters is because there is a historic uh, methane load. There's a, mm -hmm. you know, a certain amount that's in the atmosphere and it comes from all different kinds of sources, everything from rice farming and you know peat bogs and swamps and cattle and other ruminants that have been on the globe for you know millions of years and um if you actually maintain the size of the cattle herd for example um you would not be increasing um global warming at all you would just be um, maintaining that historic methane load so unlike co2 which every basically every molecule that's emitted makes global warming happen more that is not the way methane works at all. So this is a very important point for people to understand when they're discussing methane and beef, um, because essentially the animals that are on the, the, the cattle that are on the earth right now are not causing additional warming, okay? They're maintaining the uh, historic methane load. Now, the other point about methane, I mean, there's lots, there's a lot to say about methane, uh, um, but there's um, this very interesting, um, a whole bunch of additional research that's been done in the last several years about where the methane is actually coming from that is in the atmosphere right now. And there are these, it's much more complicated than people um, generally understand. 
And the people who are the experts in it, people like Dr. Robert Howarth at Cornell University, who leads the methane project there, they are, they are debating with other scientists about where the methane is actually coming from. So it's a lot more complicated than people realize. And he recently, for example, um, looked really carefully at a bunch of satellite data measuring where the methane over North America was coming from. And he argued that actually a lot of the methane that people had been previously saying was due to cattle herds was not, could not have been from cattle herds based on the satellite data and was actually due to fracking. Mm. And, um, and there's no historic um, parallel between the methane numbers in North America or globally and the size of the cattle herd. You know, so there's all kinds of um, complexity surrounding uh, how we measure methane, how we track it. Um, and, um, and we need to understand that when we're talking about methane. It's not like you eat a hamburger and then you're con contributing global warming. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, I sort of go through a lot, a lot more detail about all of this in the book, but there's also this point as well about just, um, you know, uh, whether or not the methane is even reaching the atmosphere that's coming from cattle, because there's research showing that um, the soil microorganisms um, actually uh, basically consume a lot of the methane that comes out of cattle and the healthier, going back to the health of the soil and the biology of the soil, the, the more um, biological life you have in the, your soils, the more you offset the methane that comes from your cattle. So there's really good uh, research from a number of universities showing that the more, uh, the healthier your, uh, your grazing situation is, the more vegetation that you have thriving there and the more, more diversity of vegetation that you have and the more um, diversity of organisms in the soil, the less methane that's going to come from your cattle and dung beetle populations. Also, the more dung beetle population you have in your system, the less methane comes off of your grazing system. So there's, there's just a ton of really interesting research now showing um, that the methane question is far more complex than people had appreciated. And most importantly, you know, what Dr. Miles Allen at Oxford University said to me directly when I was speaking to him in England, he said, everybody knows that everybody in the scientific community who's talking about that the uh, the cattle are really not the problem. It's mm -hmm. all about fossil fuel emissions and other industrial sources for methane. And it's just a distraction. Yeah. So I, I just kind of, that's my key takeaway message is that the methane issue is not this kind of be all end all that we've been told about, um, about cattle and beef. And really because cattle play such a tremendously important role in these regenerative systems that we've been talking about. Um, if you just threw, you know, as I like to say, the calf out with the bathwater, <laughs> you know, <laughs> got rid of cattle, um, you would be throwing away your opportunity to create truly uh, ecologically regenerative farming systems, which mm -hmm. I think is what we absolutely have to do. Yeah, absolutely. And that is fascinating that the healthier the cattle system, the less methane. And I think it's a point you said it's a distraction. And I think that is because obviously, if you're getting billions of dollars in funding for your uh, faux meat, then you are going to try everything you can to throw real meat under the bus. Yeah, and it's very interesting, Michael. A few years ago, I saw in all the kind of mainstream trade publications from the meat industry, because we, you know, we get them yeah. here as part yeah. of the meat industry. So I look at them and there was a lot of kind of, you know, a critique of, you know, um, you know, the meat alternatives that were rising up. And, um, and then it just kind of disappeared. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. And then within a year or two after that, uh, all of the major meat companies and meat processing companies were beginning to announce their new major investments in these <laughs> meat alternatives. And I thought, oh my God, you know, this is why the meat industry publications are no longer criticizing these foods because um, they're seeing it as another economic opportunity. You know, so the, the main, uh, you know, source that you'd expect to have this kind of vigorous defense of the importance of real uh -huh. meat and, and for health and, you know, the environment is not saying anything because they're also going to, they're trying to make, you know, they see yeah. this as a new opportunity to make money. So it's kind of sad. So that leaves the, you know, the kind of the farmers and ranchers out there by themselves trying to articulate this and make this case. And I kind of feel like I'm one of those voices saying, well, wait a minute, uh, actually faux meat is not and will never be able to replace real meat. 
uh, mm -hmm. especially from a human health standpoint, but also from an agricultural standpoint. Absolutely. Hey, Thriving Farmers, where are you on your Thriving Farmer journey? So if you go to our website, growingfarmers.com, you can click on the assessment button and that will take you to a form, ask you a few different questions, and that will help you figure out where you are on the five stage thriving farmer journey. And what that does then is kicks you a customized PDF that gives you resources to know exactly what to focus on next in your business to go to the next level. So go to growingfarmers.com and click on the assessment. Now, I, I think one thing you said that I think we, we kind of dived right into this conversation. So talk us a little bit about Nyman Ranch, because I know that, you know, obviously to me, I've well acquainted with the history and all that, but give us like a three minute of, you know, cause you, that's a very important piece in, I guess what I would say, regenerative going mainstream, maybe is what I want to yeah. say. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, there was a, an article, um, that a business magazine did about my husband, Bill Nyman, a few years ago, and they kind of um, uh, kind of credited him with being someone who sort of took this idea of kind of niche meat and made it something that was more widely available, you know, something that was really labeled with a not, you know, a, a name that was really mm -hmm. trusted and respected. And I and I do think he deserves a lot of that credit. Um, basically, he was um, he was originally from Minnesota and did not grow up on a farm, but he did grow up. His family had a small grocery store. Uh, Nyman Groceries in uh, in St. Paul in in Minnesota, and um, and then he moved out to uh, California and probably never thought he was going to have anything to do with uh, you know food or farming again. He had majored in anthropology in college and stuff, and he came out to uh, California and worked as a teacher. And then he started just kind of raising his own food because he moved to the little town that we live in, which is called Bolinas. And that just a lot of people were doing that then, you know, kind of yeah. getting off the grid, as they say, and just trying to raise some of your own food. And so they were, they had a big vegetable garden and um, he was working with a group, you know, small group of people that were doing this and um, they were um, raising their own pigs. And then they ended up, he ended up um, selling some of that meat to some really high end restaurants. And that sort of, shifted his whole focus in his life to um, focusing on producing, you know, meat, high quality mm. meat for, you know, in that time, at that time, it was for a few retail stores and a few restaurants. But then he began um, creating, working sort of one ranch and farm at a time, he sort of created a network. And um, he left the Nyman Ranch Meat Company several years ago, but at the time that he left, it was about uh, somewhere between seven and 800 farms and ranches that were in the network at that time. And everyone in the network um, follows, a, a, you know, a protocol as far as mm -hmm. how the animals should be treated and, you know, things that you are not allowed to use to feed or put on your land and that sort of thing. And so then the Nyman Ranch label indicated to the consumer that this was a well-raised meat. You know, this was mm -hmm. something where the land had been taken care of and the animals had been well cared for. And so I, I think that was a really important um, step, you know, towards mm -hmm. getting this, as you say, kind of the regenerative farming um, idea into mainstream, you know, uh, restaurants and grocery stores and stuff like that. So it still makes me happy every time I see the Nyman Ranch, um, you know, brand anywhere, because I know that, you know, my husband started all that and I'm mm -hmm. very proud of him for that. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about this too, though. Why beef? Because, you know, obviously there's different, there's chicken, there's pork, but then you put out, you, the, the, the book is called, you know, Defending Beef, and that's the focus. And, you know, obviously I think I know why, but kind of share what you're, what you're thinking behind that is. Yeah, well, I, I'm, you know, supportive of all well-raised meats. <laughs> I should make sure that's clear. Um, but the reason I wrote Defending Beef was because I had written a book called Righteous Pork Chop several years earlier, which was basically arguing that we needed to, you know, sort of dramatically improve the way uh -huh. we're raising animals. And it was really primarily a critique of modern confinement um, animal systems uh -huh. and really looked at the environmental side and the welfare side and so forth. And I realized after I wrote that book and I was sort of talking to people a lot that um, they would say things to me like, well, I, um, I, I moving towards vegetarianism and I, you know, I don't eat beef at all, you know, <laughs> and yeah. it was kind of like this assumption over and over again that, well, beef is the worst. So I'm just taking that off the plate. And I 
realized I had done the same thing myself. You know, when I became a vegetarian as a freshman in college, the first thing I did was stop eating beef mm. because everything I'd heard that was so negative about meat was especially true for beef. You know, that's mm -hmm. what I was being told. Mm -hmm. I was really environmentally destructive. It was really unhealthy food, you know, and, um, and so I started thinking, wow, somewhat, you know, I kind of jokingly started thinking beef needs a good lawyer, you know, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> That's gonna be me, you know, and so I started just, and of course we raise, you know, beef ourselves yeah. here on the ranch. And so I had this firsthand understanding of the, the very different impacts you can have with cattle if you do it well or badly. And then also just the, the value of the food. I mean, um, beef is extremely rich uh -huh. in a lot of nutrients that are hard to get even from other meats. Um, and so I just thought, wow, somebody really needs to make the argument that beef is not only defensible, but, but valuable and important to the food system. So, so that's why I focus on beef. And, and also I noticed, you know, there's been, um, there have been a lot of books written attacking beef specifically yeah. and, you know, books like um, diet for a small planet and things, they were really focused on beef as well. There was always this idea that kind of beef is the most problematic thing. So I, you know, the thing I, one of the things I really appreciate about, about um, Alan Savory is that he has um, not just kind of come to the, um, you know, argument about grazing animals generally, but he specifically uh, talks about the value of cattle a lot because 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 they're uh, large animals, you know, they have a much greater potential to do the healing to the earth that he really believes you must have from grazing animals. And so I think it's a really, it's almost flipping the argument on its head. You know, we always kind of thought, I mean, I even remember hearing as a child that, you know, the sort of the bigger animals do more damage <laughs> to the earth, you know, yeah. whether it's like buffalo or whether it's elephants or whether it's cattle. And what Alan Savory says is, no, you have to have these, you know, sort of mega fauna. You have to have these big animals because the earth always had it. And it has that kind of impact that you have to, you don't get from smaller animals or other non-grazing animals and things like poultry in particular, which are, you know, so small and light and they really don't have the same kind of ecological, you know, actually literally footprint that those heavy grazing animals do. So it's an interesting, almost reversal of the mindset of like, we need these bigger animals because they do more as mm -hmm. far as the whole way that they cycle vegetation through their digestive tracts and trigger biological uh, life in the soils. And they do more as far as, you know, the pressing of the vegetation and the seeds into the soils and the mo more of the, um, the cropping of the vegetation with their grazing, you know, so that, 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 that the heft, you know, that yeah. animal that cattle bring are actually something necessary, not something negative. I think that's super interesting. Well, I think too is 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 cattle are basically replaced, and not they can't replace the bison because the bison had their they're even bigger and they did even more like impact. But they're basically what is kind of now um, substituting for them. And and the other thing about cows too is they are the only herbivores, the major herbivores that we eat. Whereas chickens and pigs typically need grain or some sort of other protein and fats for themselves. Um, exactly. the cow, yeah. Cows are the only ones which you feed them grass and they grow. Well, in fact, this is, this is a really fascinating article that I, an idea rather that I hadn't thought about until recent years, but, um, Jared Diamond, who's, you know, a sociologist, I believe is his, um, is his training at UCLA. He's written uh, a whole series of books about sort of the history of the planet. And mm. he has this great book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, in which he talks at length about the importance of the domesticated animals and especially cattle. And he really traces kind of the human ability to move around the earth to our you know coexistence with these grazing animals because they can go in places where you essentially cannot raise crops mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and where you have naturally occurring vegetation but it's something that humans can't survive off of and as you mentioned you know the omnivorous animals like poultry and pigs can't do it but the grazing animals can do it they convert this 
essentially very low quality cellulose that's covering the earth in the form mostly of grass and they convert it through their you know just they just take that sunshine and that rain and that grass you know is all it's creating this grass that um the cattle eat and convert to meat and milk and so he shows how in this in guns germs and steel he shows how this enabled human migrations and continued existence around the world and also really interesting he talks about this exposure to pathogens so he he says that essentially where humans coexisted with these large domesticated animals like cattle, we had exposure to diseases and then we survived as, mm -hmm. as a, as a you know, species. And then when we were exposed to these pathogens later on, we survived. Whereas, uh, you know, um, you know, it's, he talks a lot about how the Native American population, the vast majority of them that died, died from the pathogens that Europeans brought, not because of being killed by weapon, weaponry or in warfare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was because of the, the germs. And it's because they hadn't been coexisting with these domesticated animals. So it shows how um, that provided a level of protection for the humans that did that. And that has modern implications now in defending beef. I actually have a whole section where I talk about this. Um, there's a tremendous amount of research around the world showing that where you live um, in close proximity to farm animals, uh, and particularly cattle, in fact, you have lower incidence of lots of diseases, um, especially asthma. That's been um, shown um, all over the place. That, um, oh, that's fascinating. That's kind of a modern problem, that high level yeah. of asthma among children, and that is almost non-existent in farm populations. So it's really interesting. Yeah, indeed. And, and I just find, you know, the deeper I've dug into this, the more I find the idea of attacking cattle or beef and saying we shouldn't even be eating this or we shouldn't even be raising this is just so short-sighted and it's just such a super superficial understanding of you know the earth and how it works and human health yeah. and agriculture. Well, wasn't cowpox something that you would get instead of smallpox? I I, I mix up those diseases sometimes, but yeah, the, the, there was yeah. a um, actually there was a disease that um, they, they, well they started realizing um, I think this was in England originally that that was being figured out that milkmaids yes. uh, didn't ever get smallpox, <laughs> and so that became that's became the whole process of how they figured out how to create a vaccine for it eventually. Mm -hmm. But that was because they had this other they would contract this other disease that they got directly from cattle, and that protected them from smallpox. Absolutely. Very cool. Okay. So, um, greenhouse gas, we talked about methane. We talked about, you know, the, the aspect on your diet. Um, let's talk about like, uh, where do we go from here? Because obviously we've, we've kind of defended beef. We've talked about, you know, how important it is for us, the nutrients we've talked about how it can do things that no other animals can do. Um, it, we, we talked a little bit about, let's say, like the policy changes. We need, you know, some subsidies. Um, and I think you also mentioned, like, you can vote with your wallet. But what other yeah. steps can farmers, let's say, you know, someone who's raising cattle now, what kind of steps can they be taking? Well, I think for someone who's actually raising cattle already, and so I would include myself in this category, um, it's all about, uh, I, I guess there are two main things I think that we should all be thinking about. One is how are we doing our grazing, you mm -hmm. know, and how can we improve that? Because the dramatic difference between poor grazing, I mean, it just couldn't be a, a more dramatic difference. Oh, yeah. Poorly managed grazing is basically harmful. You know, it's harmful to the animals. It's harmful to the vegetation. It's harmful to the soils. And the, the more you do that over the more time, you know, the less and less productive your whole system is going to be and the less healthy your animals are going to be. But on the other side of the spectrum, when you're doing well-managed grazing and you're really focusing on that soil biology question and grazing in such a way that you're giving, I mean, the core principle, you know, we've heard a lot of folks, people like Gabe Brown and Alan Savory talking about this for the last, you know, many years, this, the core principle is really about having an animal impact on your land and then giving it a lot of rest. So you have to have this kind of balance of the, you have to have the impact and then you have to have the rest. And so I think um, just having a more and more uh, carefully managed system, you know, one that is you know, they use the term holistically managed, um, I think is kind of the, the key for any of us that are already involved mm -hmm. in raising, grazing animals, you know, especially cattle. Um, just how can we improve what we're doing? You know, I think that's a really important point. And then 
how can we diversify what we're doing? You know, multi-species grazing has been shown to be mm -hmm. um, helpful as far as the um, both the amount of vegetation and the diversity of vegetation. It's also just show it's been shown to help the health of the soil. And so um, when you introduce species, you know, people like Joel Salatin, you know, have been mm -hmm. great examples of starting that process of, you know, having poultry moving through your system, having, um, you know, goats, having sheep, you know, you can have them together or you can have them um, consecutively. Um, these are things I think all of us should be trying to do. Mm -hmm. And also this other question of sort of focusing on the healthfulness of our the food that we're producing. And so if we're using any kind of um, chemicals on the soil or on our animals, I think all of us should be moving towards trying to reduce or eliminate those. I don't, you know, I'm not one of these people who's, you know, 100% opposed to every kind of, you know, human man-made compound in a yeah. system. You know, for example, we believe in treating a sick animal with um, antibiotics and we do that. Yeah. But we focus on the health of our animals and the health of our system. And so we very rarely have to medicate animals. And that's our whole approach. We don't say, you know, none of these things should ever be used. Mm -hmm. We always say like, okay, how can we use this in a very limited and responsible way? Um, so I think from a farming standpoint, that's the key thing. And then, you know, for anyone who might be listening today, who's a, you know, not involved directly in farming, but is a consumer and is interested in supporting those kinds of farms, I think just getting out of your grocery store as much as possible and get to um, try to get your food as much as possible directly from farmers, you know, whether it's at farm stands or from shared, you know, buying a, a portion of a farm's production or farm stands or, you know, anything, or even your local co-op that might have uh -huh. things from the local farms. You know, there are lots of different ways to get at really good food, but I think it's really rewarding in terms of the quality of the food and the healthfulness of the food. And then also you're directly supporting the kind of farming that you want the earth, you know, to, to move towards. And so I think voting with your dollars, that's a really important point. I think you just mentioned that, Michael, I really support yeah. that idea as well. So have you tried any of these faux burgers? Um, no, <laughs> you, you know why? Because I'm just so totally opposed to the whole idea of it. And to be honest, I've read, I've read a lot of different reviews from different people that mm -hmm. I know, you know, friends and, and people I don't know, but that are writing in the media. And in fact, there's a, there's a, there was a PBS segment that I was part of. My husband and I were on the um, PBS news hour uh, a couple years ago and they interviewed um, uh, P Michael Pollan, who we know well, actually he lives you know, mm -hmm. not far from us. And, and they had him eating um, one of these faux meats as part of the segment. And he, he said, well, it's not very interesting. Is it? He said, I'm glad there's a lot of cheese and mustard on this. You know? And so you know, <laughs> I, I keep seeing stuff like that telling me like from a, um, you know, taste standpoint, point, I'm not going to enjoy it. I know that. But also, I'm just not, um, I'm just so convinced it's not the right way to produce food, you know, or to, it's not the kind mm -hmm. of food I want to be eating. So, you know, I try to minimize all of the processed food that I eat and that my family eats. And, um, and so I don't want, I'm, there's a curiosity factor, yes, in a way. But I also, I'm um, 100% sure it's not the kind of food I want to eat. And so I haven't even sampled them, to be honest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the, about the farming too is, um, is there's even those of us who are, let's say doing some regenerative farming, I think the, when you hear a conversation like this and you're like, oh my gosh, look at how beef are benefiting the planet. There's always going to be the next step that all of us can take. Yeah. Um, and what I like to, I think what you said about the, uh, the antibiotics there about in, in, in usage and cattle is I think that's the one thing that I struggle with, with the national, again, there's a lot of problems with the national certified organic program and that's a whole nother conversation, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. the aspect of you pulling an animal completely out because of having used antibiotics, I think right. that's wrong. I mean, like if your yeah. kid got sick, you would give them antibiotics. You do whatever <laughs> it takes to get them well again. And exactly. then you're going to put them back onto, you know, the good food that you know that they're good, they're going to, that's going to help them. Yeah, so, that's, that's exactly how we feel about it, Michael. So that's precisely why we don't um, take that approach. In fact, we're not, we're not certified organic. Yeah. And yeah. it's largely because there, we have some of these disagreements um, with some of these restrictions. And I understand why they exist. Yeah. But I also think, you know, it, we can make intelligent choices as individual farmers and ranchers. And then we, we need to communicate uh, effectively to the people we're selling our meat to what we're doing, you know, share our stories yes. 
and yeah. be as transparent as possible. And, you know, we always had a lot of visitors on our ranch, uh, people that uh, retail people, uh, people that are um, lots of chefs have come here over the years. And, and even random consumers sometimes send us emails and say, could I do a um, visit to your farm? And yeah. we don't do, you know, sort of regular tours, but we um, almost always, up until the COVID era, we pretty much always said, sure, uh, you know, when are you going to be out in this area, you know? And we just really believe in that. And I, you know, transparency and openness and, um, you know, real communication about what you're doing. And, um, and I think that's kind of the cornerstone for rebuilding the food system as well, is that transparency and, um, honesty and integrity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause when you lose that, when you close the doors, when you shut off the lights and don't let people see what's going on on one aspect, a lot of consumers prefer it that way because then yeah. they don't have to be, um, they don't have to be morally responsible for how their food is. Right. Um, so when, and when you keep opening those doors, you keep showing, you keep showing up and, and going live on your farm page and saying, Hey, this is how we do it. Um, I snapped a picture the other day, this morning, of a ladybug larva um, uh -huh. on our eggplant. And that's the picture that's <laughs> going to get a caption and hit our, our thing and say, guys, you know, compared to seven dust and compared to this, this is how we treat um, aphids, is yeah. we, we treat it with ladybug larva. Yeah, and that's awesome. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's the thing is we have to, if you keep reminding the consumer about this, because um, again, the, parents are busy. I'm, I've got, you know, two kids and one on the way. And I know what it's like to have a, you know, a couple kids and then you start adding in soccer and ballet and that sort of thing. Yep. <laughs> so struggling to, you know, to do this, but it's so important for all the reasons that we've just spent the last hour and seven minutes or so discussing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate your time today. I know you're very busy with, you know, podcasts and interviews and getting the word out there about your new book. Um, what would you, anything else you'd want to leave folks with? Well, I guess my, my uh, sort of main thing I just try to reinforce over and over again is that we can do a lot better. You know, we can mm. do better as farmers. We can do better as consumers. We can do better as eaters, you know. And, and that this is something that, you know, it's not just about, it's not like a chore, I really think, because food is unique. It's something mm -hmm. that brings us not just health, but pleasure and joy. And, you know, you were just talking about having children. And I, to me, the daily ritual of sitting down with my two ch children and my husband, that's something we all look forward to every day, the cooking, the eating, the sharing the meal, the sharing the conversation. Food is really a source of a tremendous amount of human joy and interaction mm -hmm. and pleasure. And so I think just making it more central to our daily lives and um, putting the energy and even the money, yes, into buying higher quality, better food, I think it benefits all of us. And, and it's something I think that um, lots of people are talking about and thinking about nowadays, which I think is a really good thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time today and uh, best of luck for the book becoming a bestseller. Thank you, Michael. I really appreciate being here today. Hey, Thriving Farmers. Have you checked us out on YouTube lately? We have a bunch of new content there, including a few rants by me. I uh, want to tell you, you don't want to miss them. Um, I actually go rant about you know some of the problems I see in our space and some of the challenges I see farmers uh, facing. So go check that out. We've got instructional videos over there as well. Talk about setting up our new farm here in Ohio and all the steps we're going to do that, as well as just tutorials and tips on best practices for all sorts of things on the farm. So go ahead, check over at Growing Farmers on YouTube and see the new content we put together for you. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.